a good day to be worshiping the Lord. Sun's shining and the weatherman's talking of rain later today, so uh, we all needed that, so it's just a, just a good day. Uh, you'll be introduced to it this afternoon, hopefully. <laughs> Get you an ark built. So, anyway, uh, several announcements. I'm not going to go through all of those that are in the the uh, bulletin, but I will mention that uh, Brother David Miller will be here on Friday for our our seminar, and we're looking forward to that. And as we enter that time, we have invited we have invited several neighboring congregations. And that may uh, cause some of you to wonder about coming with, but in the past, we've not had big numbers come to our gospel meetings, but in light of that, we would ask that we can, those of us here, all of us are in favor of wearing masks, so let's continue that, and hopefully others will as well, but uh, we'll just keep in mind our social distancing and our our handshaking and such as that and and be very cautious so uh, but we are looking forward to that and uh, Nacho has asked me that if if you would be able to fix a lunch for for uh, brother David to let him know we're talking Saturday and Sunday since he will, will not be here until Friday afternoon but uh, Dan has already volunteered Christy to make a preparation. He hasn't talked to her yet, but <laughs> they'll get to that. We're not worried about that. <laughs> but anyway, we're really looking forward to that. So do keep that in your prayers, and, and hopefully we can gain a good deal of knowledge from, from Brother David. I uh, had a message from Sister Helen this morning, and our, uh, she talked to... Brother Dean yesterday, and she said he sounded more like himself than he had been, and uh, he's very aware he's got to get stronger before he can come home. And he'll be moved to rehab at Cox tomorrow, and she said that she really appreciates the prayers that we've offered up on their behalf. She stayed healthy through all this, but as you can imagine, she's lonely, and she's had to quarantine as well, so... Uh, hopefully that will soon come to an end, but nevertheless, they're both still in need of our prayers, and she appreciates calling or talking to different ones, so uh, remember them. Joe Caffey, father-in-law of Ben Thompson, uh, my son, Kathy and my son, is in the hospital with COVID, and he's very sick on a BiPAP machine. They intended to put him on a ventilator yesterday, but that hasn't happened yet, uh, but they've got him on a lot of oxygen so that he can he can uh, keep his air. But he is breathing on his own, and his wife Debbie is showing symptoms as well, but it's some better today. But if you would put Joel, Joel J-O-E-L, Joel, and Debbie Caffey on your prayer list as well. And we've had a report on Johnny Huckabee. He's completed one of his chemo treatments but it's made him very sick, and not just as some chemo treatments do, but uh, his liver is not act not working properly, and he has lost about 10 pounds in the last week, and his family's requesting prayers for Johnny. And Johnny, Brother Johnny used to worship here at one time, and has uh, is worshiping at Conway now, but nevertheless, uh, our brother needs our prayers. He's in a, in a bad way. Uh, Scott Greer, back to work, so that's good news. Uh, Sister Bonnie is doing better. Not 100% yet, but she is doing better. And um, had an email from Sister Jennifer Watkins. She's received the funds that have been donated by individuals as well as the church sent them uh, uh, some financial support as well this last week. So uh, she wanted, she said it twice. She said, I want you to pass along our gratitude and our thanks for that. So uh, uh, time of need and, and we were able to help. Uh, 
Eddie will be moving to a new facility on September 30th that will give him five to six hours of therapy instead of just three or four in there. His caregivers are confident that that's going to make a difference for him. So do keep them in your prayers. And uh, we men will meet at 1015 between worship services this morning to discuss uh, our previous decision, whether we want to remain at coming back to one worship assembly in the morning and one in the evening. And I know many of you have expressed concern over that. So uh, we're going to discuss that. And uh, we'll let you know with a one call this afternoon what our results are. So please get a bulletin and take a look at it. And if nothing further, we'll go to God in prayer as we begin our worship service. And, and uh, you'd bow with me. I appreciate it. Dear God, we thank you for this time to come together to worship you and bring honor and glory to you. We ask, Father, that you put our minds in, as one, putting out those worldly things that have that uh, muddle up our mind from some time for, uh, at some times. And we ask, Father, that we focus on you through Christ this morning as we sing, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, as we give, and as we Listen to God's word, to your word from the Bible as Brother Rick brings it. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Again, good morning. I'm going to do that so I can understand myself. Okay, number 797. The first song, Lord, we come before thee now. Lord, we come before thee now. Let the feet be humbly bowed. Hold it not our service day. Shall we seek thee, Lord, and say, Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on thee our souls depend. In compassion thou descend. Fill our hearts with thy restraint. Soon our lips to sing thy praise. To our lips to sing thy praise. In thine own appointed way, now we seek thee, here we stay. Lord, we know not how to go. Sing thou be so, till a blessing thou be so. Grant that all may seek and find be a God supremely kind, till the sick a captive free. Let us all rejoice in thee. Let us all rejoice in thee. What an appropriate time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Boy. Holy Father, we come before thee. Thanking thee for the privilege of approaching your throne of love and mercy and grace, realizing, Father, that great sacrifice was made by our Lord to allow us to do that. We thank you for the blessings that we have in Christ now and those to come, especially that of being in your and his presence forever one day. 
We thank you for your spirit, which you had the word recorded, and we pray, Father, that we are in the, the word, studying, finding out how more that we can be like our Lord. We thank you for the church that the Lord bought with his blood. We pray you'll bless your children the world over. And we especially pray for the congregation here. We pray that you'll be with the men as we meet. We pray, Father, that we will come to the session that pleases you. We also pray, Father, for our sick. We have a number who have the virus and, and those who've recovered from it. We, we thank you for those who are recovering and, and pray that you'll bless those who have it, that, that they'll be able to recover as well, not only for our people, but for those in our country and the world over. We pray, Father, that a, a vaccine will be found soon that will control this uh, virus. Father, we are blessed to live in the cargo in the country that that we do, that, that we can meet together and we worship you. We also are thankful that we have the privilege of electing our leaders. And as we were about to elect those who are going to rule over us. We, we pray, Father, that we will select those men and women who will use your word to do what's best for us and not for a particular party. We're blessed, Father, to have a military that protects us. We pray, Father, that you'll bless them we also have men and women who serve as law enforcement and, and fire people and, and people who come to take care of us when we have emergencies. We're, we're just so blessed to live in the country this way. We pray that, that you will bless all these people. We pray, Father, above all things, though, that we live in a way that is pleasing to you, that we take advantage of every opportunity we have to share the good news with those about us. We pray, Father, that we will live more like your son each day. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. We prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. We sing number 313. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Be ill above suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of love sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my Cross is at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world. As a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God, 
Let his glory above to bear it to Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my throne is my way down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a rugged cross will ever be true its shame and reproach let me bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory for So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a As it is each first day of the week, it's our privilege to gather around this table of remembrance, something that's been done for almost 2,000 years now by Christians on the first day of the week. And we know this because Christ himself established this in his last day on this earth as he gathered with the uh, 12 in the upper room. And we find that in Mark chapter 26, verse 26 and following. In Mark chapter 14, verse 22 and following. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 14 and following, as he was in that upper room, he established this table of remembrance. And he did that knowing that that evening he would be betrayed. And he did that knowing that within the next few hours that he would be handed over by his Jewish fellow brethren to a Roman army that would be willing to sacrifice him on the cross, nailing him in a crucifixion. He did that knowing that the Romans were very, very good at torture, at killing. And he knew this all ahead of time as he was with his 12 in his last few hours. And it behooves me and it sometimes makes me very perplexed to read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where it's written, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, is now set at the right hand of the throne of God. If I'd have had that in front of me, knowing I was going to die on the cross, I would not have called it a joyful thing, but he did. It's perplexing to know that as he sacrificed himself for us, that he did it not only willingly, that he gave himself willingly, but he found it a joy to do that. 
So let's remember that at this time as we partake of the emblem, the bread, which represents his body that he freely gave, the blood, as we'll take of the cup in a moment, that represents his blood that poured forth from his body, washing our sins away. So let's go to God in prayer at this point in time. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this bread, which represents Christ's body that was nailed to the cross. Father, we pray that as we take it at this time, you bless it, and that we take it in a way that's pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is prayer. Our most gracious and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity you gave us to come together together and worship to thee. Father, we thank you for the night to rest. We thank you for this place you gave us we can meet. Lord, we pray that you be with us and take our hearts and minds back in the horrible day with your son hand on the cross. That this cup we have opportunity to partake, represent the blood that he shed on our behalf. Father, we pray that you be with us and help us to remember all this and do it matter and place in your sight. Yes, I pray to your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we will take up the contribution. And also we need to remember that we have ample evidence from the New Testament that the first century church did this each first day of the week. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the physical things you do for us the food, the shelter. Father, help us to always keep in mind that all good things come from you and that you like for us to willingly give back that your work might continue here on earth. Father, help us to do so with a willing heart. In your son's name, amen. Number 469, faith is the victory. 
And camped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in bells below it all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the angels, the times upon my throne. By faith they like a whirlwind breath swept on our every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, why raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in him. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh, for it victory that overcomes the world. After the lesson this, this morning, let's go with number 647, Soldiers of Christ Arise. But to prepare ourselves for that lesson, let's think, to Christ be true. To Christ be true. To Christ be loyal and be true, his banner be unfurled. And born along till is secure the conquest of the world. To whom Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you. Then help you all your conflict To Christ the Lord be true. To Christ be loyal and be true, he needs brave volunteers to stand against the powers of sin, not by frown or fear. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you. Then help you all your conflicts through to Christ the Lord be true. To Christ be loyal and be true and noble service prove your faith and your fidelity the fervor of your love. To Thank you, Brother Clayton. Great selection of songs. I appreciate that so much. Clayton always asks me, what are you going to preach on? He works hard to pick out the, just the right songs, and it makes a difference because it helps us to focus our minds. And, of course, as we get older, we need more focus, right? Have you ever noticed that you can be thinking about something one minute and thinking about another another minute and then forgot what you thought about the first minute? Yeah, it happens, doesn't it? I'm thankful that we can keep studying and reading and learning from God's Word, can't we?
So whatever we forget, we can learn again. And this lesson will probably not entail a lot of what you don't know. However, it will encourage you to grab a hold of what you do know. So I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 to start with. And you might want to mark Revelation chapter 12. So we're going to spend a little time there. Because we're going to be talking about Satan's war on grace. We are at war. Amen? Yes, we are. And as an individual, we fight the battle as a Christian. And therefore, we've got to recognize that in that battle, there are certain elements that we must grab a hold of because we want victory. And Christ provides us access to that victory when we choose to engage in the war. And you might notice it's entitled the War on Grace. Because as you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, it describes us, as Paul talks about us, we then as workers together with him. Of course, him is Christ. We work with God. So we together as workers with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. That is the war that we are in. Because I can tell you for a fact that Satan, the devil, wants you to receive the grace of God in vain. What does that mean? Well, that word means that which is empty. So we think about something that's vain, it's as if we're looking at a container that has nothing. And so it's worthless. It has no value. If you look at its value, it's got a great big old zero written right on the jar or whatever container you might want to reflect upon. Because it has no value, no profit. Now help us to understand, when we consider grace received in vain, it's like this person right here. Obviously, he's in the desert, right? And he's very thirsty. And you can just imagine what that would be like. And all of a sudden, he has a container within his grasp. But as he picks that container up, that bottle of what should be water, it has none. And so that describes for us what it means when we think about grace, that which we need, but when we grab the container, it's empty, it's worthless, it's no profit. Paul did not want the brethren to receive that grace in vain of no profit. He wanted that grace to amount something, but Satan has another plan. Notice in verse 2, for he says, reference to God, he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. And that really is a description of grace in itself, isn't it? God knows that we need, and so he does not supply that which is worthless. If it becomes worthless, it's because of our decisions, not God. Because God knows our cry of need. And so therefore, he is there to help. In that day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, grace is there before us. As we've talked about, Christ went to that cross. He revealed the grace of the Almighty God. But it is up to us to receive it. It is up to us to make benefit of that which God has given us of great value. But then we are challenged because of the war we are in to make sure that we don't turn that grace into something that is worthless. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul describes that war. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then he cries for us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles means the schemes or the plans or the workings of Satan. Phillips translates it like this, the devil's method of attack. And folks, that's well said. Because Satan has a plan. He has his methods. And therefore, we must be willing to take a stand against him. Otherwise, grace can become worthless. And look at the description of this war in verse 12 of Vision 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts 
of wickedness in the heavenly places. Phillips, in his New Testament, translated it this way. For our fight is not against any physical enemy. It is against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are up against the unseen power that controls this dark world. Where does that come from? Who are we at war with? Obviously, Satan, the enemy. And notice this, and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. That paints a pretty good picture for us to see, doesn't it? I want to speak of the pictures. I want you to look at this picture. This is what was proposed by the Satanic Temple, a group advocating the separation of church and state. They proposed that this statue right here be placed in Arkansas at the Arkansas State House. Can you imagine? It just shows you how far the war has gone on. We are surrounded by the workings of Satan. He is wanting to destroy the work of God. And so therefore, as his soldiers, we must heed the obligation to take up the whole armor of God so that we can withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And notice it's a cry for us to start, take this very seriously because Satan wants grace to be of no effect. He wants it to be vain, empty, of no use, no profit. But yet we are not that way. We are to be people who take the stand. We fight against Satan. And we need, of course, then to understand just exactly who is that enemy. Who is Satan? Well, Scripture tells us a lot about Satan, but there's some things it doesn't exactly reveal in all of its details, and maybe one day God will reveal that to us when we're in heaven. But we can learn a few things from Scripture about this enemy. We learn in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, that there was a point in time that the angels sinned. And remember, God is the creator. God is the creator of angels. But there was a time coming when those created creatures sinned. And then, of course, we read from Peter that they were cast down to hell. That is the word for Tartarus. If you look up the original word, same word used in verse 16, referring to torment. And he delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. If we go over to Jude verse 6, the angels who did not keep their proper domain or kingdom, but left their own abode, he has reserved in an everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. God established a domain for them, a place to be, or a, as we might refer to it as a kingdom, but more the idea of a domain, an area of existence. Let's put it that way. And what did they do? They did not keep their proper place. Also, as we look at Scripture, we learn that Satan is presented as the prince of power of the air. In Ephesians 2, verse 4. Satan is also seen in Job 1, verse 6, as among the sons of God. He makes his presence known, including roaming the earth, as we read in Job 1, verse 7, also Genesis 3, 1, Matthew 4, 1. He meets Jesus. And then we read that the last day, Satan is cast into eternal fire. Revelation 20, verse 10. That's his destiny. But between our existence here and the end of time, Satan is at war with God's people. And that's something we need to be aware of. In fact, think about this. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, we read these words. Now, when they had departed, the holy angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And what is this angel of the Lord who did not leave the proper domain, who did not sin? What does this angel of the Lord tell Joseph? Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child, his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. And then notice the words, For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Herod is committed to doing that which is evil. What is he going to do? He wants to destroy the young child. 
Verse 16, and Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Think about this. Why is Herod wanting to destroy the children? Because he wants Jesus. Why would he want Jesus? What if Satan could have destroyed Jesus at his birth? What would have happened to the plan of God? Oftentimes we refer from Genesis to the end of Revelation as the scheme of redemption. God's plan to redeem man. How did he do it? By the grace of God. We learn that Jesus was destined to go to that cross as the sacrificial lamb. Then therefore the gospel will be preached. By the power of the resurrection we have hope. And so that is a wonderful plan that unfolds as we look at Scripture. What if Satan could have stopped the plan? Putting to death the child. It's interesting, if you'll turn now with me to Revelation chapter 12. Some of you are probably familiar with this chapter. It starts out, now a great sign appeared in heaven. That says it pretty well because the book of Revelation is a sign. It is that picture which is drawn for us so that you and I can see that God's people are going to be ultimately victorious. And that was a message that was needed to that group of Christians that we are, have identified as the seven churches of Asia because they were under Roman domination. They were going to face the persecution like they had not even seen under the Jewish persecution. And so they needed the message. You stay faithful even if it costs your life because we win in the end. And in this message there is signified pictures or pictures are drawn to give them that message. And you might ask, well why is the book of Revelation like that? Well John was in exile or in other words he was in prison under the Roman government. When he wrote this message to the church he wrote to people who understood the language of the prophets who had familiarity with the Old Testament. And so he could use picture language to convey a message that the soldiers would read when they would censor his writings that he was sending out and look at those writings and go, man, that guy is Looney Tunes. But the church understood the message. So he draws, by inspiration from God, a sign now a great sign appeared in heaven. And he's going to describe that sign. So he's showing us what he has given. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. And what's on this sign? A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. So this is something that's grand. And where is this woman at? In heaven. A great sign appeared in heaven. Look at verse 2. Then being with child, she cried out and labored and in pain to give birth. What we have throughout the book of Revelation is picture language, but there's bits of information that we can fully understand. And so those bits of information that John clearly gives us helps us to understand the picture or the message that he is writing. I always encourage people when they study the book of Revelation, look for the things that you know and understand. Because a lot of folks want to go and tell you what they think things are. Look for what is clearly spelled out. That's the way prophets did it. So like in Ezekiel chapter 1, we have this magnificent picture painted of the glory of God. And then we come down to the last verse and it says, this is the glory of God. And so you read through all the picture and then you get the information that tells you what it is. So John is writing, giving us a sign, and then verse 2 becomes clear. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And as you look at verse 4, chapter 12, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. What's this dragon wanting to do? To devour her child as soon as it was born. Isn't it amazing? You think about 
this war here? That's what we'll read about as we go further, we will. What did Herod want to do with Jesus? Destroy him. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to the boar, devour her child as soon as it was born. Then verse 5, look what happened. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations of Ireland. Who was born that day in Bethlehem? The king. Who became the supreme ruler? Christ. And then notice here as we see this in synopsis of Christ's life, I believe, just in, wrapped up in, it in one verse. She bore a child who was to rule the nations with a rod iron and her child was caught up to God and his throne. That is a Tremendous depiction of exactly what Christ did. He went to that cross. He died, but he reigned supreme as king. And he rules over all the kingdoms of the world. But notice verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. Now this gives us an indication that there's more in mind of the writer than just Mary giving birth to a child. In fact, I want you to think about the woman as being the, that scheme of redemption that God planned. You know, he had an election by his grace of a people who would become the church, his kingdom. You might even think of the woman as the kingdom. So what was the kingdom to produce? What was the plan of God to produce? That was the child. As you look from Genesis all the way through, there's that promise made of a savior, a child who would be born in Bethlehem, of the seed of David who would reign supreme as king. And so that promise gave forth Christ because that was what the plan of God was all about. So then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Now for some, in face of all the persecution of Rome, particularly as they would endure the terrible things under Nero and Domitian, they would think that God's plan is of no use anymore. That Rome's going to win the battle. That ultimately Satan was going to be the victor. But you know better than that, don't you? You know Satan is not the winner. We go on. Verse 7. War broke out in heaven. Now sometimes people take these verses and will point back to what took place much earlier in history. But you want to keep it in perspective. The war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. Satan's desire was to destroy the church. Satan wanted Rome to be that agent that would defeat Christians. But it was not to be. Verse 8. But they did not prevail or and it was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out. And who is the great dragon? The serpent of old called the devil and Satan. What does Satan do? He deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth. His angels were cast out with him. What does this show us? There was a defeat. Satan is not the winner, is he? At the very essence of the spiritual battle. Satan is not going to win the war against Christ and his church. Verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman. This tells us a little bit more of why we're talking about this woman being much more than just Mary. She was a part of the plan. But he's enraged at the plan of God to save mankind through the church. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, God is victor, but we still fight the battle, don't we? You and I still are engaged in the war. We are still to be the soldiers of Christ. Verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, look at what he does. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who's he persecuting? Who does he want to destroy? Christians, the church, 
He wants to totally disrupt the plan of God to save man through the, the grace that was given us on the cross. He wants you and I to make grace vain, worthless. Because if we do, he wins in our lives. And so therefore, we must understand that we are at war. Satan went to great lengths to try to disrupt the very plan of God. Look at verse 14, Revelation 12. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. I love this picture because it shows protection. And God wants the church, the kingdom, to understand as they struggle in life, well, they saw a Roman government as being a victor over them. They thought Satan was the winner, but he's not. God is the protector. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle and that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished or she is nourished by for a time and times and half a time. And that's a very protected, specific period of time. And notice what it says, from the presence of the serpent. Who's in control of this battle? God. Who's going to ultimately give the victory? God. He gives his protection to his plan and to his people. If you look at Psalms 91 verse 4, I love this verse. He will cover you with feathers. And under his wings you can hide. His truth will be your shield and protection. We don't have to lose, do we? Mm -mm. Why? Because we have a God who has a plan in place that he's protecting. He has a church and a kingdom. He is protecting. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If we stay faithful as we sang that song, faith gives the victory. If we are faithful to God, we have the promise that contains the hope that God will reward his people. He is our protector. A man by the name of James Rochford wrote this paragraph, and I want to share it with you. The night before his death, Jesus predicted that the ruler of this world would be cast out. John 12, verse 31. Some have explained that war that we just read about in heaven as being this. It goes on. By dying on the cross, Paul writes that Jesus, and that's in parentheses because he wants us to understand the context. Paul writes that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Jesus was victorious over Satan. We read Revelation 20 that Satan was bound. And I believe that's talking about the Christian age. Through the work of Jesus, we stand under God's protection, unlike before. Because of what Jesus did when he went to that cross. Through the cross, he goes on and writes, Jesus rescued us from the dominion of darkness. King James says, kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. And it's by the grace of the Almighty God that we have opportunity to experience and to enjoy that. And in there we live with the protection of God, knowing that we can win in the end. And that's why we read verse 10 of Revelation 12. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Satan does not win, does he? God's people win. God's plan will stand victorious. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Verse 11. We have the method of overcoming. Defined clearly, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of of the Lamb. By the grace of God, that blood was shed from that cross. We now have opportunity to experience it. 
And therefore, as Christians, we never want that grace to become empty, worthless. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And that's not talking about standing out and tell what, how Jesus saved us. Talking about the testimony of Christ. That's our life. The confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And also it says that they did not love their lives to the death. And there's the challenge. Because we can make grace vain if we do not pay attention to that third thing mentioned here. You see, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. When we're baptized, we're washed clean. And we are baptized with the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But then we are challenged to make sure that we live so as to not make the grace of God worthless. Therefore, we are challenged to not love our lives to the dead. We must put Christ first. So this morning, think about it. We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God. If we turn our back on God, Satan wins in our lives. Don't let him win. Stand firm with the whole armor of God. This morning, if you're here and you're not yet a child of God, you can join the army. And that's the only place of hope. That's salvation. That's the plan of God. And so this morning, we're going to stand. We're going to sing an invitation song. As a Christian, if you've walked away and not kept God first in your life, why not make a decision? If we can help you in any way this morning, we would love to do that. So stand and sing. Would you come? Soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus Christ, who in the strength of Jesus Christ is more than conqueror. Stand then in his Lord. 
born in deed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict in this is glorious day. Ye that are men that serve against the number flows. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, strength in the strength alone. His arm of wish will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, then watching up to prayer. Where do the God or danger ever wanting there? Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him and overcome a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. This time we'll be led in our closing prayer. Amen. Our Lord, our Heavenly Father, we pray that this day is a beautiful day. We pray for showers of blessing, and we look forward to things that come about for the better. I see the power of God everywhere I look, and all of our gardeners just all this summer. In that respect, I'm so blessed. Our country is blessed, and I. But let's all remember those who found our country in the 18th century with the forethought of the future. And let us not forget them that they build this republic. And we will need to pray that we move forward and be strong and keep our republic in the wicked stand. Bless this congregation. I'm thankful for them to come today. Guide us and protect us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen.